Let's rock and roll. Okay, let's do this thing. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and, um, uh, and especially to my uh, co-facilitator, Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi. And, uh, Hi. <laughs> and, and also Bradley, uh, thank you so much for jumping on the call. Um, really appreciate that. And Bradley is the, uh, the project lead uh, for the uh, Levels of Preservation Reboot project that's happening under the uh, NDSA coordinating committee. But um, yeah, so the, thank you everyone for joining us. I just wanted to, before we got underway, uh, just a couple items here. And first and foremost, I'd like to uh, I don't believe Amanda's with us, but I believe David is. We were just speaking a moment ago. I'd like to welcome uh, David from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And David, I was hoping that you might be able to say a few words of introduction about yourself and your institution. Uh, I think the institution um, is uh, unique in terms of American museums in that it's a, um, given to the people of the country. It uh, has a unique collection of the founder, uh, Isabella, uh, Stuart Gardner, and she um, bequeathed it to the nation. It uh, has some real treasures, and it has some uh, um, known um, uh, uh, paintings, such as the Titian uh, Rape of Europa and some Rembrandts and so on, but it's, it's probably better known for its th great theft that happened 26 years ago, and I think one of the biggest art thefts in this country, uh, if not globally. And so, uh, that's that's certainly um, made it one of the museums that's known about. Um, otherwise, not um, not to dwell on that. The uh, it's a quite a beautiful museum, and so about a decade ago, the trustees decided that uh, we needed to come into the 21st century or to start thinking about uh, making the collections accessible to more people electronically and. Hence, there's been a lot of um, digitization and, and other uh, access cataloging type projects underway. And uh, two years ago, uh, received some uh, federal funding, IMOS and NEH funding. And part of that uh, initiative was to try to put into some kind of preservation systems. And so uh, Nathan uh, and, and others, uh, Paige and, and um, some other folks in your, your um, group, uh, certainly were instrumental in helping us um, work through some of the uh, entrance into the meta archive. And so uh, out of that came the discussion of NDSA and we work quite closely with the Boston Public Library for which there's a, a large amount of uh, work being done through um, the, um, uh, the state in terms of what they refer to the digital commonwealth and also uh, work with the DPOA. I think DPOA is now headquartered at the BPL, uh, as well as uh, the Internet Archive has a large uh, presence there as well. So um, that has made other um, access points available to us. And then uh, both MIT and Harvard have had a lot of different uh, digital uh, preservation systems in place. I think Nancy McGovern and some of the other folks at Harvard, they, they are somewhat inclusive in their work. They're not as maybe as uh, uh, sort of cooperatively speaking, sharing with the nation, but certainly there's uh, activities happening. So we feel very fortunate to be surrounded by people uh, who are actively thinking about and, and thinking about and working towards some type of sustainability, a certain type of uh, persistence in terms of the digital realm. So for us, it's a real honor to be part of the NDSA uh, group and certainly um, with having met Nathan, I was certainly interested in the infrastructure working group. So uh, here we are and uh, we're here to learn, not probably offer a whole lot of expertise, but certainly um, rely on people like yourselves to help us out as we sort of push forward. So I, I hope that answers a few questions or gives you some idea. That's where we're at. Well, thank you very much, David. And we're, uh, we're really glad to have you aboard and um, welcome. And I hope it's, uh, hope it's a good, uh, good fit for you. And are there any, any questions or comments for David before we move, move along? Great, okay. Yeah, thanks, David. And um, uh, welcome. Welcome on board. Uh, so just the next item here, I just wanted to um, 
uh, remind people of our next session. And Sally, are you? I believe you're on the call, aren't you? Yep, I'm here. Hi, did you want to say a few words about the next session in July? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to be putting together a, um, a more finalized agenda um, in the next week or so, but um, what we discussed in terms of um, the next call was a focus on cloud storage infrastructure. Um, and there were a few themes that we discussed um, of interest. Um, one, I think it's really interesting what the recent um, NDSA surveys have revealed in terms of cloud adoption across institutions. So probably some, some framing in terms of like um, where we all are in terms of adoption. Um, recent work that's happened to map um, cloud providers against the preservation storage criteria um, and where some of the major um, cloud providers are sort of recent updates. Um, so yeah, final agenda, TBD, but those, those are um, some of the main focus points. That's great. Thanks so much. That'll be a, a really good conversation, I think. So thanks for uh, uh, organizing and facilitating that. Look forward to, yeah. to that session in July. Well, I can't believe it's going to be the middle of July in a month. Year is just flying. Me neither. Off, but <laughs> it's good. Um, and I think that Nathan is going to, uh, towards the end there, Nathan will try to, I'm actually wondering if you might want to provide a storage survey update right off the top here so that if we, um, so that we don't, uh, it doesn't drop off at the end. Would you mind uh, speaking to that right now? Sure. Um, this has just sort of been as an FYI on our agenda item for a couple of whiles, uh, a couple of uh, meetings. Um, finally able to start uh, getting a little group forming um, around running the um, the storage survey that NDSA did in 2011 and 2013 and it hasn't been run since then. Um, so we had sort of an open call here. Um, a few of us have gotten together where we had an initial phone call um, just sort of laying some things out um, and uh, elected uh, Laura um, and I might get her pronounce your last name incorrectly, Alanya, Alana uh, from Northwestern is our chair. Um, we're putting together more of a, a formal sort of proposal or sketch plan that is going to go to the NDSA coordinating committee. Um, and then after they sign off, we'll probably do a little more um, open uh, recruiting to see if there's anyone else uh, who wants to join. I think we want to keep the group fairly lightweight. Um, so we don't want to get too big. So we'll have to manage that, but um, we'll put something out there to open that up. And then hopefully um, we'll run the survey either at the end of this year or sometime in uh, 2019 uh, to be determined. Um, but we should be able to have a little more information at the next um, call here, the July call, because I think we'll have had the um, proposal go to the coordinating committee by then. That's great, thanks Nathan, yeah. No problem. Uh, and if anyone has questions or wonder what I'm talking about, uh, please let me know. <laughs> what's, what's that guy talking about? <laughs> um, that's great. Thanks, Nathan. Yeah, so we'll look forward to hearing more about that in July. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, and just to uh, remind folks um, that they can use, uh, you know, turn their microphones on if they're not using them to to mute those, but also you can use the chat function. So uh, I'm just going to move to sort of the, the bulk of the presentation today. I'm going to share my, I guess people can, people see. see yep. Here. Okay, perfect. So um, now Bradley, do, do jump in as I step through this um, and I'll, I'll call on you uh, as well, but we wanted to uh, share with the group um, the plans that are afoot with them. Um, the levels of preservation reboot project. For uh, those of you who want uh, more information on the project plan and the people that are involved and how you can personally get involved uh, or, uh, or your institution, uh, there's a, um, a link here. Uh, you can also just go to the NDSA website and, um, and find it fairly easily. And so we've, just, we've tried to put as much uh, information uh, on on the uh, on the website as possible around the project. The uh, reboot team is uh, 
um, really great uh, group of folks. A number of you uh, are on the call today. Uh, Nathan, Carol, I know, uh, Bradley's here, and myself. Um, I'm others... a poser, by the way. I told him to take my name off. I haven't done much. Oh, oh, geez. <laughs> okay. Well, we have an <laughs> imposter here. But... Anyway, uh, th see, you should have let me know earlier, Nathan, because I, I had to like adjust the font to get everyone on the screen. So, But that's okay. We'll, we'll no, it's that the part. promise of future work for Nathan. He can stay on there. Don't worry. We'll press him into service. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't worry, Nathan. You know, there'll be, there'll be work for you. But um, yeah, so it's a, a really good group of people representative of uh, a number of different types of institutions and all across the country that are, that are um, going to sort of coordinate the effort almost in a project management sense. But as we'll see in a few moments, uh, a lot of the work is actually going to happen at the uh, working group level. So uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the why are we doing this? Um, the levels of preservation guidelines were first released in 2013. Things have changed uh, and people have started to use them in the real world. And so uh, I think the intention was always to revisit, uh, revisit the document um, and, and that's what we're doing now. And Bradley, I just wanted to give you an opportunity here to maybe provide more of a holistic overview of, of, the, of the reboot project and some of the rationale behind it and why now kind of thing. Sure. Thanks, Corey. So basically, um, as most of you know, the, the levels of preservation is, is kind of the NDSA's premier brand. It was, you know, created back in the early days when the NDSA was under the Library of Congress umbrella with a lot of smart people um, participating in it. Andrea Godel's, you know, Jefferson Bailey, Trevor Owens, um, the, 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 the really smart people, and there's many more um, who contributed to it. But in the transition from the Library of Congress to clear DLF, um, you know, the levels hadn't really been updated. And what had happened was we started hearing about various efforts, um, grassroots and, and other that were bubbling up with people either wanting to have them updated, were updating them, adding to them. And, um, you know, it seemed like a good time to really develop the methodology by which we could create the the means the ongoing means by which the levels could be um, updated vetted iterated documented updated again and, and really create that that structure by which we could get good feedback of of how they need to be amended or how um, we might need to add or subtract from them that kind of thing on an ongoing basis from practitioners in particular uh, and really expose that to the larger the larger community of practice, not just in the U.S., but also um, as we've discovered uh, across the globe. So that that's really the the driver behind it. Those of us who are on the team will would probably many of us at least. I'll just, all right, I'll just say me. I would be the first to say that I uh, am no longer qualified to say that I am a deep practitioner and could speak specifically to the the levels work, but we want to help coordinate that work in a way that takes advantage of, of a lot of really smart people's work um, and builds on it. So that, that's kind of what's gotten us to this point. Thanks so much, Bradley. Yeah. And there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of interest expressed in, in participation in this, uh, in this particular initiative. So it's really, really timely, I think. I uh, just wanted to go over really quickly, kind of these very exciting slides, <laughs> talking about what a committee has done, plain white uh, background and gray letters. But so what we've done uh, so far, and, and Bradley's leading up this effort, is uh, formed a subgroup of the uh, NDSA coordinating committee that will oversee the initial activities. And again, just act as a kind of a, a collective project management team. A lot of the on the ground actual work is going to be happening at the working group level. Uh, and so... Uh, the the reboot team is going to oversee that work and, and try to coordinate it as much as possible while still um, really empowering the working groups to work as independently as possible, knowing that we have to reconcile uh, all these different areas uh, for the final publication. Uh, we put out a call for proposal to the global digital preservation community, uh, created a listserv in terms of those respondents um, and sent, uh, you know, we've, we've done the project plan. We're going to be going through that as well. And, and, and sent a follow-up survey uh, in terms of trying to identify people that want to be really active as part of the working groups 
and who just maybe want to be uh, more um, more in the reviewer role, so the work kind of gets done, and then they 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 take a look at it and provide feedback. And Brad, I just wanted to have you maybe comment on the level of interest and and um, the amount of um, uh, interest that was shown around the around the globe for this project. Sure. So for the uh, the initial survey that we sent out, kind of the call for interest garnered. Um, over 130 respondents, which surprised the heck out of all of us. And these included uh, people responding from Australia, New Zealand, all the way through various parts of Europe to um, all of North America. So you'd expect the US, but certainly Canada, Mexico. Um, the UK was also really strong in its representation, in particular um, entities in the UK, governmental entities in the UK that were using um, the levels for various means of accreditation. So a lot of very interesting uses of them have bubbled up as a result. So, you know, I think that the next step for us really is, is thinking about, all right, that's a very large group of people. And even if you take a 50% cut for interest, we, that's still way too many people to manage in any kind of real way. So we're, we're currently in the process of kind of chunking them together by interest. So, um, and I think Carol would likely speak to that a little bit later in the, in the call, since she's the one doing the, the data massaging in that regard. Yeah, thanks Bradley. And, and, and Carol, we're gonna get to a, uh, to a slide down the road here around the, um, the, the um, initial groupings for the working group. So I'll, I'll ask you to, to, um, to speak to that if you could. Um, and actually, here it is. <laughs> and so, based on that survey, now these aren't uh, necessarily written in stone at this point, but th these are kind of the clumpings that we that have sort of fallen out of the uh, the community engagement piece and that call for uh, participation. Um, and so, Carol, I'm, I'm wondering, I did, not to put you on the spot here, but if you wanted to just kind of talk through uh, the survey results, how these groupings came out, and 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 uh, and speak to that, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, I will try to do that. Um, the groupings on here are based off of kind of initial thoughts of the coordinating group as well as terms that were pulled out from that initial survey about what people were interested in and had suggestions for um, improvements or what could be added or what could be changed. And so we tried to take as much from the community as possible about what they wanted to see and to try to group people into categories that they would be interested in. Looking at the survey responses for the second survey of, you know, what categories are you interested in? What possible working groups are you interested in? Are you interested and in able to be a reviewer or, you know, a lead in a working group or an active member of a working group? Um, we received um, over 80 responses, so, you know, kind of that two-thirds cut from the original or close to that, or half. Um, but looking at the respondents, we have a tough job ahead of us because people are definitely interested in multiple areas. We did not ask them to pick one or two just because we didn't want to pigeonhole them into something. Um, but People are interested in between two and seven of the categories that we picked. <laughs> um, and looking at the categories themselves, most of them are, I'm trying to pull up a graph here. Um, most of them are all really popular. Um, there are a few, let me see, sorry. Um, so in our question about how to make the levels better, um, over 40% picked four of the categories and everything else got 20% between 20 and 40%. So there's nothing that's really low on our list of how people want to make the levels better. Um, and then the areas of interest of what people want to work on, um, everything is close to that 40% or 50% except for um, the administrative component. Um, but it did get a higher administrative component did get interest on a different question. So we have to kind of work through that. But 
Um, like Bradley said, we are going to try to find things for people to do and keep them active and hopefully on a in an area that they're interested in based on their survey results. Um, and we'll just starting this process right now. We have a meeting this week, I believe, um, to kind of talk about how we might want to do that. So it's still really early on in the process, but still good good interest and a challenge of how we're going to put people where they want to be and move forward with the work with Corey's great work plan. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's um, an abundance of interest, which is really cool. And I guess for, for me, the two sort of t takeaways is uh, the level of interest um, internationally and, and really um, the NDSA is an organization that's been very much based uh, in the U.S. and and it really engaging globally uh, with with this this project. But also, as you can see there from the list of working groups, it's not just necessarily about building another document or creating another document. It's really about creating the structures and and uh, capacity to to continue to refresh that so that it, uh, and and embed it within particular organizations and help people understand uh, the importance of it. So um, it will be, yeah, I think it's it's a really, you know, as, as Bradley mentioned before, taking the, the premier brand of the NDSA and and um, and really doing some good work with it. So th thanks, Carol, for that. Yeah, and, and I would add to that too, of, you know, that international community is important because like Bradley said, we found out that the UK is using it for accreditation status, and there's been lots of interest as well as translating it into other languages. And we know it's been in, the current version has been in, translated to a few languages. Um, so we don't, we want to make sure that we're thinking forward with that area as well for the international community, like you said. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, next steps, the idea now, and as Carol mentioned, um, is there's a meeting later this week for the, uh, the, co the coordinating group to uh, get, basically look at getting the working groups off the ground. And so there would be co-chairs from the, the reboot team that would be part of each of the working groups. The idea would be to create uh, work plans, for each of those working groups, hold the meetings, finalize those work plans, and then, uh, you know, over the course of the next little while, up until March 2019, most of the work would be happening at the working group levels with the expectation that uh, final reports and other deliverables would be back in, um, you know, kind of mid-spring next year, uh, 2019. So not really, you know, wanting to uh, not push things too quickly, but um, provide enough time for people to engage with the process, but actually get a product out uh, ne next year. Uh, so that in terms of the timelines for the pro uh, for the project, uh, again, March 2019, working groups get their final reports and sort of April, May, uh, that sort of rec reconciliation of all those reports done by the, the, the overall reboot team so that we get a cohesive document and other deliverables and share that out uh, with the community uh, for comment, for feedback, uh, to, to make sure that it, it reflects um, uh, the work of the community and, and what the community needs from, from that product. And then sort of late spring 2019, uh, start to share the results and think of strategies for um, distributing the, the publication uh, and getting the word out there. So we're, you know, basically looking at just under a year, um, at overall, just over a year, but from this point, just under a year to where we're at the point where we're gonna have something for people to, uh, to, to be able to use and implement again. Um, and I just wanted to, before we hopefully turn this over and have it become a little bit more conversational and um, back and forthy, as they say, <laughs> that a technical term. Uh, the, the one really key part of the, the project plan, you'll see this on the website, is, is in trying to effectively, as much as possible, engage the community. Um, not only the key stakeholders within, you know, particularly the NDSA, 
uh, but also the practitioner community across the globe. And so we have in the, the project plan strategy specifically around um, uh, engaging uh basically principal audiences, and we've identified those. And you can take a look uh, on, on, on the NDSO website to see how those, are, um, how those are laid out. And basically it just sort of uh, enables us to identify all the different communities and audiences that we need to keep in touch with and how often we're gonna try to do that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then in terms of uh, communication vehicles, um, the website is going to be a primary one, but we're also going to make sure that our documentation and things like agendas and minutes and stuff like that are as open as possible and using Google Drive and the Open Science Framework to do that. You'll see links on the website, on the NDSA website to those, to those sources. And then, you know, just the typical kind of, I don't know if social media is the right term for it, but um, through the NDSA blogs, uh, we've identified a number of listservs on the project plan so that the word gets spread there and also through social media and presentations at conferences and other venues where the community will be present. Things like um, DigiPres in Las Vegas this fall, iPres uh, in Boston again in the fall. Uh, and other venues um, as we step through the year as well. Bradley or Carol, I'm not sure if you had any comments around um, community consultation and uh, communications, but I just wanted to pause there to give you a chance to jump in. No, I think that's good from, from my perspective, Corey. Yeah, thanks very much. Me too. Okay. okay. So this is where, so we're at, um, you know, at the half hour here, and, and this is where we'd like to open it up a little bit more um, in terms of, uh, especially in terms of community consultation and engagement strategies, if, if folks have thoughts around that specifically. So kind of the meta conversation around how do we really effectively steer this effort? Um, the Reboot team will be talking about that later this week. So any feedback around that I think would be appreciated. And then and then, you know, also just really the, the meat of it. So are you using them? How are you using them? What do you like about them? And, and how could they be improved? Uh, and what I'd like to do is as much as possible, perhaps Bradley, if you could um, uh, answer questions to the best of your ability or facilitate this part here. And I'm sorry to kind of call on you here. And then what I could do is, is type notes so that we capture that um, information. It can be fed back into the... Uh, to the reboot team. Sure. So folks can uh, unmute their microphones. They can use the chat feature. And I'll take some notes here. Hey everyone, this is Paige from Boston College. Um, I, I'm really excited, first of all, to see that these are being revisited. Um, I'm also involved with a DLF group on Born Digital Access that is sort of, we're sort of making our own um, levels document for Born Digital Access to work with what used to be the levels of preservation. But I know you've contacted us before about integrating our work with these new levels. Um, and I saw that one of your working groups that you've identified is on access. Are you planning on, you know, reusing our work or incorporating our work or spinning up your own access level? Um, not really sure what exactly that meant, but I know that everyone in, in the DLF group is, is happy to work with you all. Sure. Um, I, I can speak a little bit to that. So Carol and I actually had a call with the Born Digital Access group the DLF Born Digital Access Group um, several, at least like three or three weeks ago or so um, to talk about strategies and, and, and whatnot. So we've been in touch, we've been communicating. And, and the short answer is that, um, you know, given where the, the Born Digital Access Group is right now, you know, we, we essentially agreed and, and let me say, and given the amount of interest in the access component for the, the levels, we, we basically agreed to say, well, for now, 
having an influx of you know 30 people into that group would would essentially dilute it too too strongly to to be of any any major use um, on the other hand, there was the acknowledgement that having a much broader perspective on the access piece than the, this relatively small group of born digital access would be helpful. So what we had decided at the time was to at least to have the, the, the DLF group proceed on its current course. And, um, you know, the timeline that we were told was end of summer-ish for some kind of release of a of an initial um, draft of some kind. Um, and then at that time, we would revisit to see where where these two efforts were, if they were going in parallel, if they were the same, you know, how how was that going to look? Carol is um, much more astute in this than I am, but you know, I think there was some question about what the final formats were gonna look like for either. So I think at this point, the idea was that Born Digital Access keep going and then um, you know it's either going to be something that we can fold into the overall work or it's something that you know will be amended in some way shape or form as an ongoing component so it's a little bit TBD does, does that help Paige? Yeah yeah it does and I think I was on that call with with the two of you earlier um, or I was on one call but it might not, we've had a lot of calls um, <laughs> but I just wanted to clarify in my head like if I remembered correctly but yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. I'd like to kind of throw a, a question out um, to folks, if that's okay. I've I've heard about some people benchmarking against the um, NDSA levels, and I'm just curious if anyone on the call has done that. I'm curious to learn more because that always seems sort of odd to me because I think it's you know, content can be appraised at different, you know, warranting different levels of preservation, but then the preservation levels document, you know, is not quite um, the same thing for everything. And so I just, I'm just curious, what does that mean if you're benchmarking? If anyone is, maybe we don't have anyone on. I have to say, this is Carol. Um, we haven't really necessarily used it for benchmarking, um, but I know that I've used it in trainings and things like that, and just as a starting point to get people thinking about some of the things that they can do. Um, and we've done coloring exercises, so it's more fun, um, where you can check the boxes of yes, I do everything in this box, or I don't do anything in this box, or I do some of what's in this box. So kind of like a red, green, and yellow scheme of green is good, red we haven't started, yellow is we do some. And so you get kind of a picture of, you know, in some areas we're better than others. And then that also kind of covers the, we don't do the same thing with all of our materials. So there may kind of be more yellows in there. It's like, well, we do it for some, but not all type thing. And so we've, we've used it for that, um, just to kind of give a picture and helping people think about how they're handling, handling those materials. So just one way. Thank you. And Nathan, this is Bradley. I can speak a little bit to one of the things, and I, this is a, kind of an observation on my point that I would be happy for people to challenge me. Um, but it's my view that the, the levels of preservation as they currently stand are very much, um, or can be very much viewed as a technical implementation of preservation and not necessarily a content strategy. And one of the, one of the drivers behind rebooting the levels was the discussion of adding a kind of a curatorial overlay so, for example, a non-technically specific um, component to levels where you could have a curator say, you know, I could talk to a donor about this and, and have a conversation with staff about what does this actually mean in terms of technical um, implications, which would then, of course, have a cost implication. And so there's very much a, a, a desire to see if there's a way that we 
could have something like a curatorial overlay to um, to the levels. But that that's kind of my thinking specifically. I would be curious to hear what others on the call how they react to to that kind of division. I, speaking for myself, anyways, I, I'm, I, I like that idea of a curatorial overlay, you know, because that really is, it's a, it's a collection management choice. You know, what are we doing with this content, and that helps um, bring it back into that, you know, collections perspective. Um, that it's, it's, it's not just the technical side. There's a subject expert who knows the value of the material and is starting to. Uh, formulate whatever the specific strategy might be for that content. Yep. Others? This is Dave Kohler. Um, at Deepin, we've done some benchmarking uh, against our offering and, uh, you know, the, the different levels of preservation. I've done a similar thing of the color coding of kind of putting green, yellow, red uh, on those. We mainly used it internally to try to understand, uh, you know, what our product offering is, kind of uh, what we're doing for members and how we should be explaining that. But it hasn't gotten very far. And I'm really looking forward to updating it and having a, maybe a little bit more granularity in the uh, criteria. Oh, this is Dina. I, uh, I also agree with you, Bradley. Uh, our thought was that uh, different collections based on the curatorial uh, aspect might have different levels of preservation necessary for them. So there is not just, you know, once, one, uh, once for all the collections. It depends on what the uh, collection importance is and how uh, the institution wants to uh, preserve that collection and make it accessible. Hi, this is Alex from Washington University. I dropped a link um, into the chat from the Orbis Cascade Alliance. A couple of years ago, um, all of us, all 37 of us did kind of a self, self benchmarking process, I guess, against the NDSA levels. And it has kind of a generalized, um, a generalized there and kind of how we did it. Uh, I agree with the whole like, curatorial overlay. I think I think for me the, the me as a as a technician, if you if you will, um, I think that 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 kind of being able to identify those differing buckets of preservation, I think, is the probably the most crucial first step to being able to make anything else happen with your content. Um, but yet, I just want to share kind of what we've done uh, through the audience as a whole, and also we've done it as as well, uh, more locally with more a um, little bit more more detail to it. So, yeah, that's good. I just sort of, I put another link in the um, in the chat, which essentially was an early early draft of of something that you know would be eventually a curatorial matrix and what we called originally at the uh, University of Virginia, like levels of collecting. Um, you know, obviously it needs to be <laughs> more refined than that, but the idea really, it has a pro, you all are great because of course you're all talking about the positive aspects. Um, I'm often thinking of the more protective aspects, which is, you know, when you have a curator that's talking to a donor and, and he or she says, sure, we'll keep, you know, we'll keep your files in perpetuity. You know, that's the kind of thing where you, you need to have someone say, whoa, okay, well, that maps to this level of preservation, which, you know, technically shakes out to, you know, since we understand our, we have a preservation plan, um, that amounts to this much per annum in order to keep these things in perpetuity. So do you have money in your budget to make that promise? And if not, then, I think we might have a slightly different conversation. So I think there's also other ways to do that to both educate and protect an institution from overpromising um, on the technological side. Yeah, thanks for that, Bradley. And Nathan, thank you for <laughs> typing. 
there, one, one of the things that we've used uh, the levels for within Copal here in Western Canada is uh, we established a, um, uh, a LOX uh, community network at five um, campus data centers at some of our larger partner institutions. M many of those data centers um, obviously run by central campus IT with few exceptions. And what the levels really enabled us to do was have a conversation with um, the IT side of the shop to help them understand the infrastructure that we were, were building out, not in terms of competition with the disaster recovery and other uh, strategies for keeping stuff safe that they do there, but just basically that we're partnering with them to achieve these kind of different goals. And it was really helpful to have the levels as a way of, to help articulate that. And um, I think that's a pretty key part of, uh, at least in, in our context, a pretty key part of the discussions and, and where the document is really valuable. So would you say, um, Corey, that the, it's really interesting that this is helping you distinguish with those IT units the differences between backup and preservation? Yeah, I think it, it just sort of helps get that conversation started, um, and it, which can be quite challenging at first. And I think yeah. initially our approach was always sort of like, well, we're doing something completely different and what you're doing is, is this other thing. And, and what this document has really enabled us to do is help frame our efforts as a partnership um, where we need these robust you know, disaster recovery infrastructures on our campuses in order to effectively deploy these kind of, um, uh, d you know, the, the kind of network that we're building in terms of the LOX network in Western Canada. There's good stuff coming up. Thanks everyone for sharing. What's the, if I could put a question out there, what, what's the biggest change in the last five years that will impact our new, you know, the, the latest iteration and what, what do people think? What's changed the most? I think I heard the word cloud there. Yeah. Cloud volume, the yeah. volume of digital material that you're having to preserve. Cloud storage for sure. What about policy maturity at particular institutions in terms of digital preservation? We're still getting formal on the whole policy thing here at Penn State. And we're even unsure of calling it policy. We're going to call it a plan. Uh, so just getting started for us. Yeah. The, the reason I ask is it's this kind of interesting thing where people are really starting to understand that different types of content and collections have different, you know, there's different strategies associated with that. And I think that's much more abundantly clear now, perhaps than it was five years ago. And, and the levels would really have to somehow address that this isn't sort of an either or thing. It's, and maybe that's what the curatorial layer is really aimed at. Yeah, this is uh, Sally from Gates Archive. I totally agree. I think that the idea of having incorporating some idea of curatorial guidance or some kind of way to capture levels of significant properties preserved is um, sounds really positive and really practical in line with the sort of spirit of you know the original levels of preservation you know it was a nice distilled um, communication tool um, and incorporating some of those conversations would be really great because I, I do think, you know, we're, I think we are as a community having more of those conversations like, oh, you're going to give me this really complicated object. What can I expect to see 
out of that in five to 10 years? Is it just going to be a big data file that I can search or is it going to be like the exact database experience, stuff like that? So, um, so I'm really, that sounds really exciting to me that those ideas are being considered. Yeah, I think those are good points, Ali. This is Bradley again. And, and that's largely because any, any larger organization or any organization really usually or hopefully has a, a, a landscape of preservation services, not a single preservation service. Um, and so figuring out, and as Dina said earlier, you know, no one collection probably, unless it's some kind of monolithic collection, would conform to a singular level of preservation. So having the means to disaggregate collections and then map them to services or service layers is would be critical for ongoing maintenance of collections. Granted, I think it increases the complexity, but if you have a methodology, then I think that's more easily achievable. I, I don't think we have that right now. And I think people are still thinking in terms of, I need one service to do everything. So how do we balance a very nuanced and flexible service need with having to pay for multiple services, which quickly becomes onerous. I think, um, Bradley, that's a really excellent point. Just within the Canadian context, I would like to see a document that we could use to help um, people decide at a particular institution if there's multiple services, some of them regionally based, others nationally based, what would be the best fit for a particular bucket of content? Um, you know, with a, something like a locks network that you, you have all this high redundancy, uh, but it increases the cost. So it's probably not the best thing for your petabytes of research data, maybe for a more, <laughs> you know, something like your electronic theses and dissertations and really, thinking about how to layer like services that are available to the community um, and incorporate, you know, sort of the, the intersection between all the services that are available to people and, and this kind of document and how to, how to maybe make connections between the two is really something I find really interesting. Okay, other, I know a number of us, I'm starting to get to 10 minutes too, I'm sure everyone's getting their little little buzz on their phones for the next meeting in 10 minutes, or many of you anyway, <laughs> but um, it, without sort of a, trying to, I don't want to cut the conversation short here, but um, other other thoughts? And, I'm going to one, I'm going to make one appeal to the, the to the community uh, as the part of the the levels team and that is we need to find and i don't think any of us has a gr good idea about this um we need to find a format to provide this information in something as easy as the current levels document is which of course that's one of the pros and cons of the levels document which is it's oversimplified but yet it's simplistic enough that many people can use it we're going to have to try to figure out a similar version um, while still balancing the, the high degree of complexity of, of the material. So if anyone's got some kind of formatting genius gene, um, by all means, please, we, we, we need you. <laughs> Help us. Help us. Um, yeah, that's great. And I'd, um, yeah, so I'd, I'd really just like to thank Bradley and Carol, both of you. Um, uh, I've been pretty much out of the office for the last two weeks and, and called on Bradley and Carol very last minute to help out um, with this conversation. So I really appreciate both of you uh, jumping in um, uh, really uh, quickly there. And, and Nathan, thanks for taking uh, really excellent notes there. Um, yeah, so I really appreciate everyone's feedback. Uh, Bradley, you know, I, the, the others on the, uh, the Reboot team, I think we'll, we'll have lots of information to take back to the uh, to the to the reboot uh, project team. So I'd like to thank everyone for being a part of the conversation. And Nathan, any uh, any final words as co-chair? 
Uh, no, I don't think I, uh, I have anything. Um, i excited to hear uh, um, Sally's upcoming cloud storage uh, infrastructure group. Um, Sally, is that going to be at all um, a joint thing with the content interest group? I know there was sort of some talk about that, and I don't know where they landed. Um, I've been talking with them and joining their meetings, um, and I told them they were welcome to join that call. So I, I expect there will be some cross-pollination. They sort of have a little group spinning up um, like cloud use case studies, I think, um, where they're trying to do more, more detailed analysis of different scenarios where people are using cloud. Um, that might be interesting uh, to look into. I think Matt Schultz sends pretty regular emails to NDSA all about those um, if anyone wants to learn more. Um, but I don't think I have anything else, Corey. Okay, great. Well, thanks everyone for jumping on the call. Thanks again to Carolyn Bradley uh, for contributing last minute and have a great rest of the day, everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Corey. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.